welcome everybody. Um, today I'm following up with my tomato grow along, grow along with me series. Um, if you've been following me since day one, your tomato plants should be about this size by now. So I have started transplanting my tomatoes and I wanted to discuss tips and tricks to correctly transplant your tomatoes to get the biggest harvest ever, I hope. Um, also, if you have any other general gardening questions, you can ask me anything. Um, it's not just about tomatoes, but the topic or subject today is tomatoes, but I will answer any of your questions. Hello everybody! Um, have any of you started your tomato seeds yet? Just put it in the chat. I just want to know like where people are at at this point, if you're at the same point as me, or maybe you're, you haven't got there yet, just so I kind of know um, you know, how to better manage this session. Anyways, um, if you've started your tomatoes or maybe not yet, just put it in the comments just so I know where everyone is. I'm going to continue talking about how to transplant tomatoes. Um, oh, I see your comment. Yes, two weeks ago, a bit behind, but super excited. You're probably not behind if your zone's eight and up. Literally, I'm zone 9B. I start my last um, sowing of tomatoes December 1st. The whole goal with tomatoes is to just, in the warmer climates, is to harvest everything before summer comes because it's a disaster when summer comes. It just kills off your tomato plants. They are so susceptible to diseases and pests and just everything, and that summer pressure and growing season is just not ideal for tomatoes. So best time is fall, winter, and spring. So I literally, I am still starting tomatoes even today. I'm still buying more varieties and stuff. It's kind of crazy. I think I'm up to 72 different varieties of tomatoes, which is insane. Um, I'm not like a farm. <laughs> I do have like two gardens, my own personal one, which is where we're at today. This is my personal garden at home. Um, this area is only 50 feet by 19 or 20 feet. So it's very small, but I have close to 50 tomato plants in here <laughs> and they're the big size they are beef steaks and stuff like that um, all my cherries and smaller sizes are going in my second garden that is on two and a half acres that I'm building that up um, you're new to gardening well welcome <laughs> follow me where are you located hopefully we're in the same um, kind of similar zones East Coast Melbourne welcome we're neighbors basically so yeah so you can start your tomato seeds all the way up until December 1st. That's the last time that I will do it in my zone. If you're zone 8, you're like two weeks ahead of me, so maybe the end of November is your last chance. Um, or sorry, zones 10 and 11, you're two weeks behind me, so the end of November, it, you should probably get them in by then, or start your seeds by then. Um, but anyways, so um, let's go ahead and start tomatoes. This is um, a Cesaris Canestrino di Luca. I started this from seed on July 20th. I'm obsessed with like traditional Italian heirloom tomatoes. So this, this basically has a story behind it. The seed came from an Italian chef that came here from America and he brought the seeds with him from there. So um, anyways, I'm very excited to grow this one um, this season. And just some of the um, products that I recommend for um, growing tomatoes. Um, they're recommendations. They're not requirements, but it definitely serves a purpose and really helps you take your tomato growing skills to the next level and improves flavor, production, and a lot of these help prevent um, diseases and pest issues that you will find along the way. Definitely if you live in Florida, um, such as nematodes and stuff like that that we deal with here. In Oregon, you guys are lucky you don't have to deal with that issue. Nematodes are a microscopic worm that um, infiltrates the plants through the roots and there's really no treatments for it unless you want to douse your garden in like tons of chemicals which is not what I want to do but I do have um, something here that is organic that I am trying this year um, so yeah they love sandy soils and warm wet soils so they definitely proliferate in the south especially Florida if you're up north you don't have to worry about them if it snows in your area you don't have to worry about them the snow kills them they can't survive in that so it's definitely definitely an issue that we have here in Florida and that we need to I guess implement practices to prevent it as much as you can um, so anyways um, this is my recommendations 
Um, the only thing that I say you you must do, please, put some fertilizer in the planting hole. I don't care what kind of fertilizer. Um, if you use synthetic stuff, that's fine. Just um, make sure that you mix it really well in the soil because when you plant um, these uh, the tomatoes, if they come in direct contact with the um, with these synthetic fertilizers, it will burn their roots and it can affect your plants. Uh, that's why I always use organic fertilizers. You can fertilize with organic stuff like over and over and over again. You're not going to burn your plants or like um, overdose them, so to speak. So that's why I really like the organic stuff and I use um, Espoma. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, but I always talk about them. And they have a tomato toned variety. Um, if you can't find the tomato tone, um, they have a garden tone or a vegetable tone, I believe, as well, or just general, like whatever. Or even if it's not Espoma brand, there's tons of other brands that are organic. I really like the granular stuff in particular because when you mix it in here, it's slow release, and that will help feed your tomato plants during a longer period of time. So just put some kind of fertilizer in there at minimum. These other things are recommendations and I'll tell you why I suggest them. Um, first up we have azomite. Um, this is rock dust. It's a lot of minerals, nutrients, stuff like that that you don't find in like general fertilizers. Uh, general fertilizers are more focused on NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, um, which is important. But sometimes plants need you know those little micronutrients and things like that that uh, apparently <laughs> People who grow tomatoes say that it improves flavor. Uh, so, for example, um, if you go to Europe, I went to Greece, and they're growing this tomato there the, on an island, a volcanic island, where their soil has a lot of um, micronutrients and minerals and stuff like that. Their tomato flavor is very intense, uh, more so than what I get when I grow the same thing here in Florida, because my sandy soil doesn't, doesn't have that kind of mineral content. So um, I do like using azomite um, for flavor and just, just give them a, an added um, nutrient boost. This is powderized. I do have, um, in my bio, there's an Amazon link where I have all these products listed in there so you guys can find and, and see what I'm talking about. This comes in powderized form. I bought a huge bag and it's literally lasted me years. You only need a little bit. This does take a while to break down. It, it's rocks. It, it does take a while to, to break down. So preferably you should um, amend your soil with this stuff ahead of time, like a, a couple months or a couple weeks ahead of time. But I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm still going to put it in here though. If you can find water soluble azomite, that is the best because it will um, dissolve in water and be available to your plants sooner rather than later. But this is what I have and until I use this all up, I'm not going to go buy some more azomite. So Anyways, if you can find azomite, great, great thing. Not only just for tomatoes, but like anything that you want to grow. So uh, let me sprinkle some of that in here. So we put that in our planting hole. Also, your planting hole. It's very deep. I don't, I don't know if you guys can see that. It's probably hard to see. It is a deep hole. When I plant my tomatoes, this is the only crop that I plant in this way. You want your stem to be 8 to 12 inches or more, something like that. I, I believe this is probably a little bit over 12 inches at this point. Because you're going to bury half of it. I don't know if you can see these, these little flaky nodes or whatever. These are roots. Like, if this comes in contact with the soil, it will grow roots. And so, by burying half of your stem, you're stimulating the, the parts that are buried to um, output roots. And therefore, your plant will have a bigger root system. If you have a bigger root system, you have probably a bigger plant that's going to output even more. So that is why um, a lot of people, when you grow tomatoes, you bury half the stem. I can't think of any other crops where you do that. It's more of a tomato thing. Um, but anyways, very, very important. Please do that. If you're unable to dig your hole deep enough, like vertically, some people will dig it um, like horizontally and then lay your plant horizontally so that you can bury the stem, if that makes sense. So you can do it either way. It doesn't matter. But anyway, so I have my deep hole, put some azomite. The other thing, um, I have chickens, so I always have lots of eggs. <laughs> and I save all my eggshells. I dry them when I get enough of them. I save them in a, um, a freezer bag in my fridge so it doesn't stink. 
Um, and once that freezer bag is full, I dump them all out on a baking tray to bake them for like 10 minutes at 220 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's to dry them out so that I can put them in my blender and blend it up as fine as you can. Um, I don't have the best blender, so mine always stays a little bit more chunkier than I'd like. But as fine as you can get it, the better. Because this is calcium. The eggshells provide calcium to your tomatoes, which is very important to prevent blossom end rot if that is an issue in your garden. It definitely is an issue in my garden. Here in Florida, we get rain like crazy. It, it has been raining every day day like I swear this week and that's pretty awful I've already planted a lot of my tomatoes you can see them all here they're struggling um, they're they're not getting a chance to allow the soil to dry out in between watering and they're struggling so um, a lot of times when you when it rains a lot I will notice blossom end rot not just on my tomatoes but like on my peppers or my zucchinis um, particularly and sometimes melons and, and cucumbers and it's not more necessarily that your soil is lacking calcium it's more that the moisture levels in the soil are inconsistent so that's why it's important to mulch because that will help um, stabilize the moisture and keep it more consistent um, if it's not consistent it it creates an issue where the plant has problems uptaking the calcium that is in the soil into into the plant so a lot of times it's not that you're lacking calcium it's more, it's a water issue. So I tend to see that a lot when we get a lot of rain because there's a lot of excess water in the soil and the plants are really struggling. Uh, and there's really nothing you can do about it once your you know, tomatoes are affected by it. It's no coming back. You just have to pluck that tomato off and throw it out. So, but anyways, I have all this extra eggshells. Might as well use it. I'm gonna dump some in there. Um, calcium is kind of similar to azomite. It doesn't break down. Um, you know readily available to your plants very quickly um, some people uh, will mix this with vinegar because the acid activates it and breaks it down to make it more readily available faster to your plants which is fine I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm gonna put some in in the planting hole and I just I literally just sprinkle some in there um, I don't measure any of this stuff out guys it's all organic so you're not gonna have a problem <laughs> if it was synthetic stuff then um, I'd be a, a little bit more careful about how much you're putting in there but since I have this, might as well use it. Might as well add a little extra calcium in there in case my plants need it. The next thing, like I was talking about nematodes earlier, there's no real like organic treatment for it besides, the only thing I'm aware of is um, crab meal. So I got this big tub because, well, I need a lot of crab meal <laughs> for all these tomatoes. But this, you can buy this in a smaller package. Um, so this is from Neptune's Harvest. I've heard a lot of good things about this brand. A lot of people that I um, follow and stuff like that like like this brand and recommend it. But this is crab meal and this helps prevent nematodes because when you mix this in the soil, it, I don't know, activates or something and, and attracts um, beneficial bacteria, I, I don't know, fungi, whatever, um, that like to eat the the crab meal is chitin if I'm saying that correctly the, the actual shells um, the what it's made out of they like to eat that stuff so when you're attracting those um, beneficials technically type of um, bugs or insects or bacteria whatever it is um, they also eat um, the I believe that the outer shell of the nematodes is made out of chitin so by attracting those chitin eating organisms they will eat the nematodes there as well so a lot of people will, like if you have a nematode infest infestation in your garden, they'll amend their soils with crab meal and, and other things, but it's said to help a lot. I personally, I haven't seen um, a big nematode issue in my garden, but I definitely want to prevent it because if you get them, it takes forever to get rid of them. So I would rather, you know, prevent stuff from happening and not have to deal with it, hopefully. Um, so I am sprinkling um, some crab meal into the hole of each um, each tomato as well. So let me get some of that. And it does have a, a strong ocean type of smell. <laughs> but anyways, again, if you want to look at this product, I do have a link in my bio to Amazon um, if you want to get the same one. Um, yeah, so anyways, crab meal to prevent nematodes. All right, so that um, that's basically all that I put in uh, my planting holes for tomatoes. 
there's a million other things that you can add in here too but that is like the basics and why I like to use those things so let's um, get our tomatoes I when I start my tomato seedlings I put two seeds in each cup if they both germinate I am putting both of them in there <laughs> I don't care they're fine um, so this one broke off unfortunately when I was moving all my supplies here to get ready Roland please have a seat don't go over there <laughs> it's my son um, so I'm going to break this off and I'm going to put this in some water. Please, baby, go have a seat. And, um, this will grow some roots and it'll be another plant for me. So anyways, yeah. And if you are, um, you know, uh, pruning your tomatoes, <laughs> take all your little, um, pieces and start them more extra free plants for you. So anyways, let's take this and we're going to plant it in the hole. It literally rained really hard, like 30 minutes before this, and I thought I was going to have to cancel, so everything is soaked and really gross, but um, anyways, I'm glad I was able to make it because uh, this was an important session in my opinion, um, so you guys know how to transplant your tomatoes, especially if you were starting them in July like I was, you should be at this point. So anyways, um, we planted our tomato, um, the final thing is mulch. You want to mulch um, the entire surface. I, I'm growing my tomatoes in this plastic stuff, so it's kind of hard to get the mulch in there, but I do shove it in there and I build a nice mound of mulch. Mulch will help with moisture, and mulch will also help prevent backsplash. There's a lot of bacteria, funguses, molds, everything. Let's just say everything, because my tomato plants will end up getting everything at some point. I don't even care to diagnose what it is anymore. In Florida, they're going to get everything. Let's just say it like that. <laughs> Um, so that stuff lives in the soil and it lives in the air. So because Florida is so humid, all that stuff travels in the air and it spreads. So that's one factor. And then the soil, um, when you're watering your plants, the water will backsplash soil onto the leaves and then the disease or whatever will start crawling up your plant and infect your entire plant. So mulching is very important to prevent that. Um, I, I don't know if you guys can see, yeah, here's one that's mulched right there. It's a little tomato here. Um, or you can grow other crops beneath your tomatoes. Um, there's lots of things you can grow beneath your tomatoes. The, the most important thing is that it's something that's low, that doesn't get too tall, obviously. So perfect thing is bush beans. So this is, um, some bush beans here that I have, and I have them in between, um, all of my tomatoes. As far as spacing goes... I have um, planted my tomatoes, even the big beefsteak ones, like one foot apart, and it works. I still get tons of tomatoes. Um, normally, though, people say to have them at least two feet apart. They might compete for nutrients and whatever. I don't find that mine compete for nutrients or are affected in any negative way by being um, one foot apart because I have a very strict fertilizing regimen and they're constantly getting nutrients. So I fertilize them almost weekly with just small doses of the tomato tone to keep the nutrient level consistent and keep that growth growing and flowering and all of that. So I don't find that they um, struggle at all being planted that close. However, you do have to keep up with your pruning game because they will be massive little shrubs and this will be like a forest, a jungle of tomatoes if I don't um, manage that which is bad because number one the worms that like to eat tomato plants like army worms or little brown ones with like two little black eyes on their head or the infamous uh, tomato hornworm um, the green ones that are nasty things that'll destroy your plant eat it down to the ground overnight um, they can easily hide in all those leaves and everything if you have a lot of overgrowth um, so if you're spraying which I do spray I use spinosad um, to control those bugs those worms, um, it, they're, you know, they're hiding and they're kind of protected a little bit. So sometimes you'll miss them. And anyways, it's always good to keep your plants, um, well pruned. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one thing to consider if you're planting them one foot apart. Um, this year I have a little bit more space. Um, I have a second garden now that I'm, I'm still building it up, but it's on two acres at my aunt's property. And um, so I decided this year to plant my tomatoes two feet apart just to kind of help with 
giving them more space to vine out and, and everything, and I don't have to be so strict with um, my pruning and stuff like that. Um, so I'm hoping, you know, that'll help with airflow and prevent some of the leaf diseases and stuff like that. Um, with the leaf diseases, I've, I've had videos and I've said it before. I only use hydrogen peroxide, one cup of hydrogen peroxide mixed in a gallon of water and I, I spray them all. Especially after heavy rains, like it's been raining, um, lately. I can already see they're, they're starting to get some, um, I don't know, molds, funguses, whatever, black spot, yellow spot, all of it. <laughs> Um, and so after a heavy rain, I will spray them with hydrogen peroxide and that cleans and disinfects them. And that's all that I use, um, for leaf diseases. For the worms, I use the spinosad. There's really nothing better than spinosad. Um, some people will handpick those worms. I don't know how you do it, but I have literally like almost 200 tomato plants and there's just no way that I'm going to be able to handpick everything. So I'm using spinosad. But I only spray the tomato plants. Don't spray any of the neighboring flowers or anything like that. Spray in the evening when all the pollinators are gone. And, you know, just be careful with that. It is considered an organic um, gardening treatment. But anything, just, just be careful. <laughs> just only spray when you notice actual damage and, and only spray the affected plants. So, um, so yeah. Um, another thing to consider just when you're planting, if you're growing a lot of different varieties... Um, one year I had, um, a row of black beauty tomatoes, like one next to the other, right? And that was it. That was all the black beauty tomatoes I was growing that season. We were getting a lot of heavy rain. I think it was like October because, well, that's still hurricane season. So we still get a lot of rain here in Florida. And with that rain, you know, saturating the soil, it causes bacteria molds, all that stuff to move very easily throughout the soil. It goes in the water and it, it spreads. It spreads all over in, in, in the root systems and everything. So I had um, tomato wilt and it uh, so happened to affect that entire row of tomatoes of Black Beauty. And tomato wilt is probably one of the worst things because there's nothing you can do about that. And you'll know it's tomato wilt when well, one day you come out and look at your plants and they look beautiful and healthy and normal. And the very next day you come out and they are wilted, like wilted down, dying. You don't see a reason why it's tomato wilt. There's no treatment for it. You, the plant's not going to recover. Don't wait. Don't, don't say, oh, I'll wait a week and see if it perks up. It's not coming back. If it has tomato wilt, it's not coming back. And so, um... You will have to yank out the whole plant and then I get like a boiling pot of water and I pour that in that hole to try and disinfect um, for that virus. I believe it's a virus. Um, so anyways, um, it wiped out my entire row of Black Beauty tomatoes and I had no Black Beauty tomatoes that year. I was very sad. So when I'm deciding where I'm going to place my tomato varieties, I mix them all up. I have like a Black Beauty back, black back there, one up here, like completely just mixed up in the advent that they get tomato wilt or it's crawling around my garden that it doesn't wipe out an entire variety for me um and just know like if you're in the <coughs> south it's rainy wet all the diseases and stuff we have you're gonna lose some tomatoes <laughs> you're gonna lose some um it's just part of it um uh, there's just so many things so um you know have extras uh. um my favorite varieties i grow like six or so of the of plants of that one new ones that i'm testing out I grow two, so two cups, basically, of um, a new variety that I'm testing out. Um, and that's just kind of how I do it. Um, another thing, um, I'm trying new this year, actually. So I have a, by the way, I have, I just posted a video on TikTok, um, a tomato transplanting grow, a guide, like a full guide, where when I was actually doing all of this here. So you can see me actually, you know, planting all of them. And I review all the um, products and stuff that I like to use. Um, I linked that in my, um, I forget what it's called in TikTok. There's like a folder. There, I have a tomato folder. I put it in there. So if you guys want to reference um, any of this that we're talking today, um, you can check that out. Or I will be posting this same um, video on my YouTube channel if you want to reference it later. But um, I built this. I also have TikTok videos of how I built this um, trellis system. It is T-Post, and I think it's 20-gauge, um, four-stranded wire. Um, I just ran them and wrapped them around the T-Post. So very good um, and easy to do. didn't take a lot of time. Um, after I did this, I um, 
found these tomato growing hooks, um, which I, I'm going to try this out this year. Uh, when I prune my tomatoes, a lot of people will do single stem. I do like two, maybe three sometimes. Um, that just helps manage the leaf and help, you know, keep the plant um, open to the air and, and drying and stuff like that. It doesn't um, necessarily affect production. I mean, if you just leave your whole tomato plant and never prune it, it's going to produce a lot. Um, but the whole pruning, the whole idea around pruning is to manage the size and um, keep the plant open to air and prevent disease, really. So that's why a lot of people like to single stem, um, maybe double stem. Further along this season, I just let it, honestly, I just let them go crazy and there's a lot of stems. But anyways, at the beginning, I try to be as organized as possible. Um, so I found these um, tomato roll hooks. So these trellises, I have wire going across. These hooks um, just hang on the wire, just like that. They don't move very easily. Um, but it's a roll of string. So I will tie this string to the base of my tomato plant and put a, or put a hook, wrap it around so as it grows. Um, this is, this is um, predominantly used for the single stem method, okay? So I will wrap this single stem tomato and as it grows, um, because my tomato vines get like some varieties I have get over 20 feet um, long. The triple L crop um, Italian tree tomato definitely gets over 20 feet. That is a tree by the end of the season. Roland, please have a seat over here. Go, have a seat. Um, so this is, this is very useful. Um, you will tie the bottom of the plant, wrap this around. As the plant stem gets longer and longer, you will just release this. You just pull it and you continue. Um, you pick this up and you just move it down horizontally a little bit just so that vine can go horizontal and, and have more space to grow, basically. So this whole line here, um, the tomato vines are going to wrap around, wrap around, wrap around during the whole growing season. And I'm hoping that it will just make it a little bit easier to control them and keep them either single or maybe double stemmed. Um, so we'll see. Um, I'm trying this out on um, some of my tomato plants, not all of them, but just to see. But I do have, um, this is also in my in my bio to the Amazon link. I think the section is like garden supplies and tools if you want to get the same ones. Um, the idea sounds great and I'll definitely be reporting on TikTok, um, you know, as the season progresses, what I think about them and if I if I like this method better. Otherwise, I literally just get some twine from like the Dollar Tree, the Dollar Store, whatever, tie it at the base here, and then kind of attach it onto this um, wire, and that's it. It'll just do its own thing. I've even grown tomatoes slowly, um, solely up um, a T post with nothing, no trellis, no nothing, and I actually like that a lot. If you're doing single or double stem, it just makes it very easy to see where your stems are and just keep them clean because you're just like wrapping it up this T-post. Um, that's actually how I grew my Italian um, triple L crop, which I have seeds for that. I have seeds for a lot of tomatoes in my Etsy shop. And I just started a new website, jarasgarden.com too. Same stuff on there. Um, but a lot of my tomato seeds are there if you want to grow the same ones. Um, but the triple L crop, the seeds are there. If you have the space, please grow that one. It's just so cool. I had a 10-foot T-post, and it was up that T-post and over, like ridiculous, and covered in like nice size sandwich um, red tomatoes, like just beautiful. Um, really cool. I'm obviously growing that again every season. That's one of my favorites. But do the tomatoes survive winter in Florida? Yes. Yes, they do. I'm zone 9B. Um, if you could put what zone you're in, that would be helpful. Um, they definitely do. If you're upper North Florida, zones um, like 8, you get a little bit colder than me. Um, you might have to protect your tomato plants. Um, I say might because if you plant them now, they're going to be huge by the time we actually get cold, which, which for me, uh, the cold fronts start coming through the last week of December and we have a few more in January and that's pretty much it. It's a handful of nights, like three or four nights that I actually get a little bit worried. But, um, you know, if you if you have full size tomato plants because you started them now and you planted them in the ground now during fall time, 
they're going to be big plants by the time that cold weather comes and they'll be able to, to um, I guess, sustain, um, survive through some of those lower temperatures because it doesn't stay cold that long. It only stays cold for a couple hours. The coldest point is right before sunset. So it's like not enough time to thoroughly like kill the plant. You might get some leaf damage for sure, especially if you're in zone eight, you might get some like cold um, leaf damage, but I don't think it's gonna kill your plant. I'm in zone nine B, it doesn't kill my plant. Um, I've been recording um, like the weather in my own garden over the last couple years. The coldest night we had was this year actually, um, that cold front that came in January, like the middle of January. Um, it got 30 degrees Fahrenheit in my garden, um, but uh, no, it, it did damage some of my tomato seedlings because I had some seedlings that I had just transplanted. They were about this size. Um, it did cold damage their leaves, but it was enough to kill the plant. And they bounced back. Like in a couple weeks, they bounced back. They grew. I harvested a ton from those before summer came. So if you're um, 10B... Oh, um, yeah. So if you're in zones 9, 10, 11... It's not going to get cold enough to kill your tomato plants. I don't even cover mine. You're good. If your zone's eight, there there could be a risk there. You're definitely a little colder than me by five to ten degrees, and one degree makes a difference. Thirty-two degrees Fahrenheit means water is freezing, and the water inside your plants freezing, and that's what kills them. So you will just have to practice. Give it a try, though. Please give it a try. If you're in zone eight try it. It might work. My garden is up against my house, which emits warmth. I mean, there's a lot of factors um, in your own little microclimate of a garden that might, they might grow just fine. So just give it a try. Um, are you growing any more of the pomodoro? Yes, yes, yes. I have, I think 16 of those <laughs> plants, actually. 16, um, which is the most out of any variety that I'm growing. I dedicated 16 plants to it. Um, this, um, season I had two. Um, so yeah, going from two to 16. I love that tomato. Everyone else online has gone crazy about it. So I really love that tomato and I, I definitely dedicated, um, a lot of space to that one this season. Um, there's a couple more as well that, um, I think will be comparable to that variety or, or, or something, um, that are new. So we'll see how those go as well. But, um, yeah, so this session um, was 30 minutes. We're at 6.33 now, so 33 minutes. you guys have any more questions, um, I think I covered everything when you get to the point of transplanting. The next time we're going to meet, I think, is in a month, in about four weeks. Um, by that point, you'll see, you know, a lot of growth on my plants and, and you know, kind of see what, what to look forward to. Depending on the variety, um... Obviously, the cherries and plums and stuff like that are going to start producing for you sooner than the beefsteaks. Those take a little bit longer. So about December, I start harvesting the cherries, and then January, February, March, April. Um, April and May are actually big harvest months for me for all the big fruiting types of beefsteaks and all that. They take a little longer to get to that point, but totally worth it. <laughs> um, so do you guys have any other questions before I go? Oh, you have your notifications on. Good. Um, I think I have my own website now, but Etsy is definitely better for the notifications if you want to get notified when something comes back in stock. Um, so definitely, if, if you guys are interested in Pomodoro, that one sells out. It sold out in like 20 minutes when I went live last time. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I had just listed some and it, it sold out. So, um, and I have tons of people messaging me about it and stuff. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, Subscribe to the notifications in my Etsy shop if you want to know when when they're back in stock. Is neem good? I keep getting small bugs. Um, I don't like neem, <laughs> and it's because my garden is located in Florida, where it's very hot. Any kind of um, oil, because neem is an oil that you spray on your plants, you run the risk of burning the leaves because it's so hot here. Um, and I just don't think it works against the type of pests that we have. I feel like our pests are like mega pests, okay? They require something a little bit more stronger than gardens that are north of us. That's just my opinion, though. Um, a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of Florida, Florida gardeners that love it. I mean, give it a try. 
give it a try in your garden. If it works, great. If it doesn't, um, then you know. But I personally don't feel like it works against the, the things. Um, all the leaf diseases, when you, a lot of people recommend neem for leaf disease, right? Powdery mildew, stuff like that. I treat all of those things with my hydrogen peroxide and water mix. One cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water. Done. <laughs> it treats, it cleans all all leaf diseases, uh, bacteria, uh, molds, fungus, whatever, all in one. And it doesn't burn my plants. So I will usually spray that early in the morning or lately it's been raining a lot after the rain is gone before, um, you know, nighttime or whatever. So that's what I use for leaf diseases. The only other bug issue that I have um, with tomatoes, they always come, they will come, are the army worms. I haven't seen tomato, the green ones, those big fat green ones, the tomato hornworms. I've never seen one in my garden. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, because they're definitely in Florida. But uh, for the worms, I use spinosad or BT. BT is great. Spinosad is like BT uh, t taken to the next level. BT, um, both products, this is how they work. You spray the leaves, the, the worm chews the leaves, therefore ingesting the product and it disrupts their digestive system or something, and that's how it kills them. Um, both are organic products. Um, spinosad, however, also has the added benefit of killing on contact. So it's a little bit more stronger. Um, I definitely use that with corn because the type of worms that, um, that corn get just didn't seem to react very well to BTE. So I, that's where I ended up finding out about spinosad, that it just works a little bit better. It kills on contact and it has a little bit of residual you know, layer on the plants, it'll last for a couple days, whereas BT just washes right off. So anyways, that's my opinion on neem. Um, and uh, BT and spinosad will also um, work against some of the other smaller bugs as well. So it's not just the worms, it'll it'll work on some other things. I have a link um, to Amazon in my bio where I have the spinosad that I use. It's Monterey and it's it, it says on that packaging all the different bugs and stuff that it actually treats. It's not just for worms. How do you know when you have a nematode infestation? It, that's hard. Normally you find out when it's the end of the season and you're pulling all your plants out and you notice their root systems are like knobbly. Look up, Google it, you'll see, you'll see what I mean. Um, nothing else looks like that in my opinion. They look knobbly and white, like bumpy, um, thick, um, not nice straight thin root systems. Um, if you notice your plant is just in general not healthy, um, not producing well, just something off and you can't figure out what it is, I mean you could check and see if it's a nematode problem. If you're in the south, it very well could be. Um, if you are, if your garden is in sandy soils, like you haven't amended a lot, or uh, my, my bed started out as raised beds, so I brought in a lot of the soil. And then um, a couple years ago, I got a ton of chip drop and the, I covered this entire area with like eight to 10 inches of chip drop and that has now decomposed and the soil under here is very, very rich. So um, I, that's why I don't think I struggle so much with a nematode problem. I also like, I know I have this black plastic here. Um, this is only during the growing season. At the end of the growing season, I, this is easy. You just pull it up. And I throw like banana leaves, um, chip drop, uh, ch uh, wood chips if I have it, like whatever branches of stuff, um, marigolds, like when I'm yanking out my marigolds or pruning them, um, just throw, I just throw that stuff everywhere. <laughs> just put it everywhere. Put it in your compost. Um, so that way every season you have more compost or stuff, or organic um, material and biomass to put back into your soil. Um, because we do have sandy soil, whenever you add compost, it, it literally like it disappears. <laughs> it just gets washed out, it's gone very quickly. So if you're not constantly like replenishing that, um, you're just going to end up with sandy soil again. So, um, but that definitely helps with nematodes because they they don't like you know composted healthy soil so much. They like the sandy stuff. Has to be cold pressed neem oil. Um, I bought very expensive um, neem oil, cold pressed. Um, I forget. There's another term to one of the ingredients on there that you want to make sure um, it's a certain concentration or, or whatever. I bought the good stuff before, and I just I still don't notice anything. <laughs> so I I don't know. Um, to each their own. It might work in your garden. It might not work in mine. Um, literally, something that works in your garden might not work in your neighbor's garden. 
it's just whatever it's just how it is <laughs> any recommendations on those white grubs I have an infestation of those what kind of white grubs what are they eating it's kind of hard to diagnose unless I um know what we're talking about are they eating the stems of your plants or are they more in the soil and attacking where the stem comes in contact with the soil are they eating the root system um, grubs can be a little difficult um, if they're soft bodied and they're not in the soil use spinosad spinosad will work on them um, but if they're in the soil that's that's difficult um, I, I really don't know what I would recommend for that besides pulling the plant out if it's in a pot change out the soil or pull the plant out and then pour like hot water in there to kill off the the eggs or the grubs or whatever um, if um, you know you can send me a picture if you want um, through message um, people message me on Instagram TikTok, whatever um, with pictures and I diagnose you know their pest issue or leaf disease if I can or whatever so um, feel free if you take a picture that that would help the most to figure out what's going on you guys have any other questions before I go I'll just wait a few seconds here oh I've been I've started selling plants now just so you guys know <laughs> I'm an official nursery now um, that's a goal of mine that I've had for many years a lot of people asked me hey can I buy these plants from you whatever and I just I said no because I don't I don't want to get in trouble I do things you know the correct way but I'm now a licensed nursery so I am slowly adding plants um, to my Etsy shop or my, my website um, I've considered um, I don't know if you guys have an idea for me let me know because um, I have been contacted by people that want to buy tomato plants from me um, so I don't know if maybe taking pre-orders or I, I don't know I don't know how to work a way around it and then ship them to you <laughs> I can't have people come to my house to pick it up but um, if you guys are interested in getting tomato starts from me or something let me know give me some ideas and I'll see what I can put together but I guess that's it for tonight guys um, check out the schedule I, I can't remember the exact date but I want to say it's four weeks from now that we will be meeting again um, so hopefully you guys start your seeds or you have nice healthy transplants and um, we could see where everyone's at then, okay? If you have any other questions, feel free to message me. Have a great night, guys.